So let me introduce the panel. Uh, we have, of course, Dr. Richard Dawkins here, a former professor of Oxford University. He told me he is retired now because they have mandatory retirement in Europe still, and so uh, maybe that's, he can be even more prolific in writing books what he did so far. Uh, astounding what he has written. Uh, he is, a, I think, still a fellow of the Royal Society, uh, which is it's for lifetime. Not, no retirement age, um, which is the equivalent of National Academy here. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, Charles Simoni Professor of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University. And as you know, he is still very prolific in writing a children's book, actually. Then uh, next we have uh, Dr. Anthony Pinn, who is uh, from Rice University, a Professor of Humanities and Religious Studies. And uh, he is also co-chair of the American Academy of Religions Black Theology Group. Then we have uh, Dr. Sikivu uh, Hutchinson, um, who actually was uh, educated at NYU. And uh, she's now at UCLA and uh, is also a fellow of the Institute for Human Humanist Studies and uh, editor of Black Females Org. Not correct, yeah. Um, so for her, it's actually, uh, what do we have now? Middle of the afternoon from LA. People always remind me of that, especially when they have morning sessions. Then we have uh, Todd Stiefel, who uh, had founded the Stiefel Laboratories of uh, dermatology uh, products, and uh, now <clears throat> he's uh, head of the uh, Stiefel Free Thought Foundation. And then last but not least, uh, our graduate student, uh, Mark Hatcher. Um, he's vacillating between who should be his advisor, one of our professors down here or I. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming and enjoy the evening. And then please, uh, who wants to start the discussion? I'll do that, Dr. Graff. Thank you. Right, please give a hand. <laughs> Please give a hand to the man who controls my PhD in the future, so. Um, first off, I would like to start off, doc, uh, Dr. Dawkins, I'm noticing that wonderful shirt you have on right now. It says that we are all Africans. Now, I... <laughs> now, that's easy for you to say. You were born in Kenya. So, for, for those of us not born in Kenya, um, could you please explain why we are all Africans? I'm a fairly recently retired professor, and I'm professorial enough to draw on this convenient whiteboard here. <laughs> that is six million years ago, and that is the common ancestor of chimpanzees, and bonobos, and humans. That is about seven million years ago, and that is the common ancestor of all those and gorillas. That's about 12 million years ago, and that's the common ancestor of all those and orangutans. Orangutans, as you know, are Asian apes. Gorillas, humans, bonobos, and chimpanzees are African apes. Darwin conjectured long before there were any available fossils that the right place to look for human fossils was Africa, and he worked that out by pointing out that humans most resemble the other African apes, namely chimpanzees, well, they didn't call them bonobos in those days, uh, and gorillas. Uh, the reason that we know approximately the date of the common ancestor is molecular evidence comparing the genes, comparing the proteins of these various animals. It's possible to calibrate the date at which a common ancestor happened. Uh, and we can date the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees and bonobos at about six million years ago. Unfortunately, there are no fossils down this line here, possibly because they're forest-dwelling animals. Nowadays, unlike in Darwin's time, there are quite a lot of fossils down this uh, line here, and they're all in Africa. Uh, we've got um, the genus Australopithecus, sort of about halfway down. 
Ardipithecus there, um, and uh, Homo habilis there, uh, Homo erectus about there, um, and then Homo sapiens, archaic Homo sapiens there, and then modern Homo sapiens there. Lots and lots of little branches quite well documented in the fossil record here, um, all extinct except the last one, uh, Homo sapiens. You may have heard the phrase out of Africa. There were two out of Africas, Homo erectus, about uh, a little over one and a half million years ago, left Africa and colonized Asia and Europe and um, arguably Indonesia as well. Um, no, in that, not arguably, definitely in Indonesia. Um, that's the first out of Africa. The second out of Africa is very recent, probably less than 100,000 years ago. If you look molecularly, if you look at the, at the molecules of modern human races, they are astonishingly uniform, and uh, such variation as there is is mostly within Africa. So that suggests that the deepest divides of cousinship in our species are within Africa. Um, the whole of the rest of the, of, the, of the world is a very, very recent branch off the, 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 the human species. If you look at the amount of variation in the human species genetically, it's extremely low. We are a very, very uniform species compared to other species, even chimpanzees. It's been said that if you take two chimpanzees from the same forest in Africa, they're likely to be more different from each other genetically than any two humans in the world. It's a bit surprising when you consider that we, to our eyes, at least look more different, but ge the, the genetics is very clear that we are an astonishingly uniform species. We are all uh, one species, one very uniform uh, species, and we originate very recently in Africa. We are all Africans. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dawkins. Now, this is a forum on science and faith in the black community and in the community in general because we're black, but we're Africans. You're white and you're Africans. You're Hispanic, you're Africans. We are all part of the human race. So what we want to focus on is, at, at first, we want to focus on the science of, of part of this conversation. And I asked some of my wonderful colleagues at Howard University to type up some questions. And most of the questions that I will be asking tonight will be coming from the, the wonderful students of Howard University, the real HU. <laughs> I stick that in there. Now, um, Professor Dawkins, I often hear gross misconceptions of the scientific method and, and the rigorous verification process that hypotheses must go through in order to be generally accepted as true. Many people believe that scientists can effectively bend information into what they want to be. Can one of the, the scientists on, on the panel describe how information is effectively tested, reviewed by peers, and reported? Do, shall I do that? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're all human, and um, uh, scientists are human just like anybody else, and are fallible, and, hum and uh, as human, scientists have, their, have their, their biases. But science is relatively unique in that it has built into itself, built into its procedures, methods of getting rid of bias. So, for example, when testing drugs, scientists use double-blind control trials, which mean that neither the doctor nor the patient uh, nor any of the people involved in, in the research know which of the doses that are being given to experimental patients are um, the actual dose that's, that's supposed to be having an effect, the experimental dose, and which is the control dose, the, the placebo control dose. It is systematically built into the procedure that bias is eliminated so far as possible. Uh, then again, scientific papers are rigorously refereed by peers to look into any possibility of mistakes. Then again, any scientific finding which is controversial or is very important is going to be repeated by somebody else in a different lab, possibly in a different part of the, of the world. So there's no such thing as a, a, a locally, a culturally local American science or Chinese science or Japanese science. It is just science. 
And it is science that is policed by this rigorous procedure of um, controlled experiments, double-blind experiments, refereeing papers, and, and repetition. So although there is bias among individual scientists, science above all disciplines takes elaborate precautions to eliminate that bias and to end up with objective results, which you will get anywhere in the world if you follow the procedures correctly. But being that scientists are fallible and, and that they do not know the answer beforehand, is it, wouldn't it be prudent to say with, I don't know, evolution? We might not be right about that. Why, why should we not teach the controversy between evolution and so-called intelligent design? Why, why, not, why, why don't they have equal say? Let's teach the controversy about human reproduction, the stork theory. <laughs> There's got to be... It is very reasonable to teach controversy where there is controversy, but there has to be controversy. And it's not enough just to have some people who don't know any science saying there is a controversy here, let's teach it. Thank you. Now, uh, this is another question that came from one of the wonderful students who happens to be sitting in the audience tonight. Uh, there is an alarming number of formally educated blacks, even within the physical sciences, who refuse to accept evolution and the Big Bang Theory. Now, many people think that exposing young children to these ideas is unacceptable, but that leaves more time for these children to be taught alternatives that aren't founded in scientific and evidence-based reasoning. How early do you think that we should expose children to these concepts and let them make the decision for themselves? And how do we reverse the indoctrination already done? And I, this is a question posed to all of our panelists. Well, I seem to be... <laughs> okay, this is... Um, I don't think it, you can start too early. If you ask me specifically about evolution, it, it isn't that difficult to understand, and I would teach uh, certainly seven-year-old children about evolution. Um, it is, after all, the truth about why we exist and why we are the way we are, why all living creatures are the way they are. Uh, it's extremely interesting. Children can understand it if it's taught in the right way. So I would teach it um, very early. What, what I would say about indoctrination, though, is let's always try not to teach people what to think, but teach them how to think, and teach them skepticism, teach them the, the, the rigorous method of thinking through doubting, testing, um, don't say, you will believe this because it's true. Um, say, you should, you should look at the evidence and, and decide for yourself. And in the case of evolution, if you do look at the evidence and decide for yourself, you will decide in favor of it. Okay. And, and I would say that um, looking more specifically in terms of um, the landscape for African Americans, what's at stake for African American young people in a global context where increasingly young African Americans are at risk because they don't have the kind of you know, educational moorings, if you will, within rationality, within skepticism, within critical thinking, um, by virtue of the deficits within American public ed education, uh, whereby you have urban schools that are really besieged with the regime of high stakes testing, with the regime of uh, basically teaching to a test that does not critically involve science literacy and science education, at least on uh, the K through eight level. So you have that dynamic of disparity in terms of access and equity, um, a dynamic that is going to be um, really detrimental you know, for African Americans when they move into academia and when they move into professions you know, in terms of trying to move forward into professions that are science and rationality based. And we know that um, there are approximately only 6% of science and engineering graduates that are of African American descent. And that was based on 2009 statistics. And that's egregious when we consider that there is an 11 to 12% um, a proportion of African Americans within the United States population. I think it's important to reverse that question in terms of why would you not teach evolution to children. Typically the basis for not wanting to teach something like that would be a fundamental denial of reality, typically a religious-based one. So, well, religions also teach 
that the sky is as solid as iron, that there's a permanent, there's, that the earth has four corners. Well, those are in conflict with the current scientific understanding of the world. So should we not teach about space to children? Should we not teach geography to children? Because that also is in conflict with the religious beliefs of texts, which frankly were not written at a time where there really was a science. And that was the best explanation they had at the time. If we attempt to take texts that was written before the scientific method was really even developed and use that to explain modern science, we're going to get ourselves into a heck of a lot of trouble. But you've got to understand that a lot of their, I think the, the prevailing view is that it's a metaphor, that it's poetic. Um, and how do we break out of, how do we decide what's poetic and what's real, what's metaphor and what's real? What, how do we impart that message that there wasn't a, there weren't pillars holding up the, the, the firmament of the earth? And um, I think that question is answered by uh, evidence-based challenging of hypotheses. So, um, yeah, now we, we, we breached a little bit into uh, comparing science and faith a, a bit. Um, and Dr. Penn, I wanted to ask you, in, in comparing theology to science, over the last hundred years, what, what are the, the advancements that theology has brought to humanity and what has science brought? Wh which of the two have contributed more to advancements and, and on the flip side, which have, have contributed more to suffering? In, in part, it's, uh, the question's a bit unfair, mm -hmm. right? Comparing theology and mm -hmm. science, you're asking, with theologians, you're asking them to bring knives to a gunfight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We have... Okay. That you, you, with theology and with science, you have both interested in the who, what, when, where, and why mm -hmm. questions, right? But for the theologian, those questions are addressed through the, they're addressed through the retelling of particular stories, right? That theolo theologians in large part are not raising critical questions concerning the world. They're simply unpacking how particular faith stance have understood the world. Most folks will think of theology in very simple terms as God talk. Right? And it doesn't involve this kind of critical engagement. It's a way of safeguarding and advancing a particular faith stance. A particular, it's the voice of a particular religious community. Right? So if, if, if you want to press for a positive out of theological discourse, the best that you can say is that it has allowed for certain forms of survival. But then you have to ask the question, is that sufficient and at what cost? Right, so for example, theology in addressing issues of moral evil, whether you have in mind racism, sexism, whatever, right, in large part, the modern theology has addressed these sorts of questions through something that I refer to as redemptive suffering arguments, right, that you have these negatives taking place, racism, and that out of this negative comes a profound positive. In churches, you'll hear it put this way, no cross, no crown. The idea that out of this misery, you don't have to correct for this misery because out of this misery comes something that's inherently positive and useful, mm -hmm. right? On some level, it has promoted a certain type of survival, but at tremendous, tremendous, tremendous cost. And in part, that cost has been a surrender of subjectivity of full humanity. What science has contributed is quite evident, quite clear. So I would, I would say, just um, to be sort of devil's advocate, um, <clears throat> yes, there's been um, a lot that's been sacrificed in terms of subjectivity. But, I mean, we know that religion has been uh, a kind of bedrock for civil and human rights resistance, not just for African-American peoples, but, you know, for peoples globally. And then womanist um, theologists would say that the firmament of the God concept has really allowed us to establish some degree of a subject position within Holocaust conditions, within even patriarchal and sexist conditions. It's um, conferred us with a voice, you know, an authentic voice that we might not have had, you know, if we did not fully subscribe to this notion of a, a supernatural, you know, eternal reward, redemptive suffering, if you will. Um, so 
what can we, I guess, right. divine from that? Well, well, let's push the point, right? If you, if you talk in terms of black theology and womanist theology, these are, these are developments that take place within African-American communities starting late 60s, moving towards the present. If you take those into consideration, they really revolve around a robust Christology. That is, they revolve around the Christ event. For black theologians and for womanist theologians, what is this thing all about? What is religion? fundamentally about, it's about the Christ event. But you even have some disagreement within that camp. You have certain womanists who argue, yes, out of this suffering comes something profound that's useful, we have survived as a result, but at great cost. And you have others like Dolores Williams who argues, well, there's something fundamentally wrong here, right? That we've fixated on this Christ event, and if this Jesus thing teaches us anything, it's that humans mess stuff up, right? We just mess things up. We are capable of great good, but we're capable of great harm. And so for her, from her perspective, rather than this attention to God and this attention to Christ, she wants to argue for ethics. The question becomes, what do we do? It seems to me that lends itself to something that's more substantive, but it's still premised upon the sanctity of this sacred text, this fictional mythological text. And you can make this text say whatever you want this thing to say. Mm -hmm. sure, I would suggest African Americans, rather than relying on this biblical text, might turn to their own experience, their own stories. So for example, give me Richard Wright over Paul any day. Now, I mean, would, would it be fair to say then, to summarize, that science has contributed a lot in the last hundred years, and theology has contributed precisely zero. <laughs> but, well, let me, let me ask, let me ask a, uh, to, be, to be fair, let me ask, what, would, the, um, would the abolitionist movement have happened without religion? Would the, uh, would the civil, would civil rights movement happen without religion? Well, and you can answer that simply, that Frederick Douglass, Right? It, certainly, if nothing else, agnostic. Right? If you read the autobiographies, we have Frederick Douglass, who is not a huge fan of Christian faith. Right? Mm -hmm. Civil rights movement, we talk in terms of Martin Luther King Jr., but we forget about folks like James Foreman, who argues that as a student, he lost any reliance on the idea of God, that he understood as a college student that it was all about us, period. Mm -hmm. right? So you've got this kind of humanistic and atheistic perspective within the struggle for civil rights during the mid-century, but we tend to ignore those voices and make this a story about the movement of churches and church figures, which in itself is an act of bad faith. It's a problematic move that even if you listen to Martin Luther King Jr., he argues these churches were not involved in large numbers, right? That they weren't giving money. They weren't stepping out there, right? So we've, we've, we've surrendered the civil rights movement to a theistic orientation over against the evidence, right? And as a result, we fail to take into consideration how folks who are not theists, who are atheists, who are humanists, who are agnostic, have also pushed for uh, quality life for all. Well, we can, we can, and I'm gonna go a little off script here, but uh, people will argue that the, 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 the Christians that aren't living up or the, the, the Muslims that are living up to their peaceful decree. They're just not being true Christians or true Muslims. They're not living in Christ. Now, how can we be moral if we do not have a theistic guide, a Bible or a Quran? Where, where would that morale, how would science explain the morality that seems to be innate in everyone? That, see, that, that pain that we see when we, we see suffering on TV, that ache that we get inside. How does science explain that? But you also have to address the flip side, right? That in the name of God or gods, you have atrocious activities taking place. So you can flip this and ask the question, how, you, how can you behave morally and ethically with respect to folks who don't fall within your group if you believe in God? Yeah, and then again, if we actually look at, you know, biblical texts or the Quran and the degree to which those texts are absolutely, as Dr. Penn is pointing out, predicated upon atrocity, upon barbarism, upon really a promotion of Holocaust conditions, okay, for those who are not within the dominant culture that's, you know, articulated as being norm 
within those um, sacred texts. Um, we don't need a basis within supernaturalism to posit morality or posit ethics or posit, you know, a, a universal good. You know, we can look at, you know, collective agency. We can look at, you know, the, the principle of um, doing unto um, your neighbor as you would, you know, do unto yourself. Um, those are, are not uh, categorically based Christian, you know, or Quranic or Talmudic, you know, concepts. And I think that, again, trying to foreground the historical trajectory of a secular humanist, you know, basis for African-American civil resistance and liberation struggle, you know, is absolutely critical for trying to deconstruct these dynamics of patriarchal oppression and heterosexist oppression uh, within African American communities that are, are believed to be monolithically, you know, based upon this regime of the, theistic hierarchies. We all use a level of ethics that comes from beyond our religion. For example, just in our interpretations of sacred text, we have to take ethics that is outside of the religion to interpret that. So, for example, we take Leviticus and say, the ban on shellfish is foolish. We should be able to eat shellfish. We also look in Leviticus and see the adv advocations of, uh, advocations, seeing that there's a allowance of slavery directly in the Bible, and it's repeated throughout, and yet we know that's wrong. So we take a sense of wrong that's outside of, you know, from my background, a Christian upbringing, and take that and interpret the text in a way that's completely independent of the Bible, as a matter of fact, contrary to the Bible in this case. Well, I mean, you bring up an interesting point. A lot of people hear you say that there's an allowance of slavery in the Bible. Is, is there? Is, is that in there? And can we talk about that? What, what is the biblical justification of slavery? How do, I did bring a few quotes on that. Okay. <laughs> Conveniently. So how about Leviticus 25, 44 through 46? This is, the word of, this is God speaking here. However, you may purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around you. You may also purchase the children of temporary residents who live among you, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat them as slaves, but you may never treat your fellow Israelites this way. That's pretty direct. Now, that's Old Testament. You get a lot of people say, well, oh, but Old Testament's different. How about the New Testament? Well, there's several New Testament passages as well, including one which this is the word of Jesus, and this is from a parable, so it's a little bit out of context, although I would question why he used this parable to send his message without using the parable also as, an, as a statement against slavery, where he says, and that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. That's Luke 12, 47. So, Interesting Bible quotes there. It seems pretty direct. Uh, what do the others on the panel think? And the fact that you can quote some biblical verses one way and other biblical verses the other way, which of course you can, the criterion by which we today decide which ones we like and which ones we don't are of course non-biblical criteria. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I also want to breach a subject that is a bit tender in the, uh, the black population, which is homophobia. Uh, there's this rampant um, denigration of the homosexual man or woman in our community. And it's, it seems to be a problem with blacks everywhere, especially in Africa, especially in the Caribbean, that, um, I mean, is there a way to combat this irrash irrational intolerance against um, our homosexual brothers and sisters? Yeah, I mean, I think that it can be done on a number of fronts. Um, you know, coming from an education perspective where there's, there's not a lot of culturally responsive pedagogy and curricula that really focuses on um, trying to promote the humanity and the agency of gays, lesbians, and transgender folk. Um, that's a big deficit. And there are a lot of... Um, progressive education reform advocates who are working on, you know, trying to implement and to embed those kinds of pedagogies and curricula. Um, and then on the more community basis, um, again, we have to get back to where these perceptions and stereotypes are coming from. And a lot of them are radiating from this, you know, obsessive fixation with biblical literalism. And I think Anthony can 
evoke where the specific references, you know, in the Bible, you know, that denigrate, you know, homosexuality are, because I'm not a biblical scholar. But again, there's this pervasive, you know, mythology within African American communities that being gay, being lesbian is not authentically black, that it's not essentially African American, you know, if one is not within the proper boundaries of heterosexual norms, heteronormativity, or heterosexual relationships. And that goes back, obviously, um, you know, to, I think, a, a broader context that really marks heterosexuality as being other, as being outside, you know, of Western norms as well as African norms. So again, there's this presumption of heteronormativity that I think has really damaged you know, African American communities in terms of being you know, very aware, um, very critically conscious of how LGBT folk um, are very much a part of the agency and the, the struggle of liberation within our communities. Now, I, I find this, this topic particularly repulsive to me, honestly, because I, I see the struggles that our brothers and sisters out there in California are having with Prop 8 and we're having with Prop 8. And I uh, see many black people out there actively campaigning against uh, homosexual rights. And I'm like, people, this, is, this was us 60 years ago. What are you doing? What, this, we, we were fighting, they, they were fighting for our rights 60 years ago. Why aren't we supporting them now? What is the problem? So, I, you know, um, I guess I'll move on from that. Well, no, just kind of related to this, it seems to me that much of this problem stems back to an earlier philosophy within African-American communities. How do you secure your place within the U.S. social and cultural structure? And it was the philosophy of respectability. If you can mirror in your community what the dominant population understands as proper family structure, right? Proper, proper representations of masculinity and femininity, then you can make progress. And as a result of that kind of philosophy, still embedded within African American communities, you get this kind of venomous response, right? The idea that, that lesbians and homosexuals destroy the fabric of the black community. Again, it stems back to this rather warped philosophy of respectability, that there is only one type of family structure that can get you inclusion within this society, right? And we've kind of fueled this out in a variety of ways, and we've given it a certain type of oomph through theological arguments, mm -hmm. right, that are drawn from scripture to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, scripture can be interpreted and read in a variety of ways. You can look at Sodom and Gomorrah and you can interpret this many ways. One, you can interpret it as a critique of a particular lifestyle, a critique of how folks love and whom they love. Or you can read it as a critique of a lack of hospitality, that that's the real crime here. Mm -hmm. So again, you get this played out in a variety of ways. It seems to me that, you, that we cannot adequately address this problem through a simple challenge of church theology, right? Because theology is premised upon faith. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change this through reason, right? That it seems to me it requires a different type of engagement. Information, on one level, information concerning how families have always developed within the context of the United States, right? African-American families. Right, and a kind of critique, an interrogation and a critique of this warped philosophy of respectability, what it did not achieve for us, and the kind of harm that it actually did. That rather than getting full inclusion and rather than supporting, supporting and nurturing the growth of African American communities, it, it really resulted in a kind of venomous ripping apart, disregarding of certain segments of this population that ultimately has gotten us nowhere. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, I want to sort of piggyback on that. Like, it is, is the, the black church has been typically sort of seen as the backbone of the American family, uh, of the black family, the, the backbone of, of social justice, the, the, black, the backbone of the struggle. But in the age of Obama, is, is the black church even really relevant right now? Do we really even need the, the, the uplift that, that allegedly comes from our, our faith. One thing is clear, black churches have had good PR, 
right, that they've told their story well and as a result have had a, a presentation, right, have, have had a stature that is really larger than their numbers and their real impact. Um, Joseph Washington, back in the 60s, said something that still bothers me every time I hear scholars reiterate it. That in the beginning was the black church and the black church was the black community. So deeply problematic. Right, that there are ways in which the black church has been present and to the extent that it has helped with socioeconomic and political advancement, to the extent it's done that, then it's promoted a certain type of survival, again, at great cost. Right, that folks, to get those benefits, had to surrender something of themselves. And this has been deeply problematic. And to get a sense of how this works, you don't have to turn to, you don't have to, turn to the Bible, to, to turn to the materials that's generated within this community. You get a sense of the deep problematic nature of the black church from folks like Nella Larson, right? Richard Wright, James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who argues in the fire next time, look, he joined the church for pragmatic reasons. He argues in that book he joined because growing up in Harlem, you had to belong to something. Right, and he says, growing up in Harlem, he could belong to the pimps, the drug pushers, or the church. He picked the church, right? But he later leaves recognizing that life needs to be much more robust, much more complex, much thicker, more reasonable and rational than the church allowed. Right, again, the church has had tremendous PR but I'm not quite convinced that it has really done a tremendous amount to advance African Americans within the context of this country and beyond. What we get with President Obama is an opportunity to reevaluate and interrogate the value added by these churches. We've had this opportunity, in large part we've lost it, but we've had an opportunity to reevaluate what these institutions have actually done. Right, what they've done to advance us and what they've done to harm us. And it seems to me they've done more harm than they've done good. Yeah, and I think that um, testimony to that is the emergence of the megachurch movement you know, within African-American communities. And of course, front row and center is the latest controversy uh, with Eddie Long, you know, the, the bishop of New Birth Missionary Church. Missionary Baptist Church. And uh, Long is basically a professional homophobe, you know, has been on the front lines in opposing marriage equality and same-sex marriage and has been um, a very vocal advocate of a kind of hyper-masculine uh, cult of heteronormativity, you know, that calls on black women to submit to the glorious patriarch in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And so that kind of um, movement, you know, within the Black Church Foundation has been, I think, really insidious with regard to advancing what has been the historical legacy of civil resistance and liberation struggle, intersectional liberation struggle within African American communities, meaning feminist, anti-homophobic, anti-heterosexist liberation <laughs> struggle. Um, that's, that's not just part of a theistic tradition, but is also part of, as Anthony pointed out, a secular humanist tradition. You know, that was advocated by thinkers like Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Nella Larson and Zora Neale Hurston. You know, that is uh, really repressed within the official histories of our culture. And so the, oh, the so, whole... Zora Neale Hurston, by the way, was a Howard student. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Little product placement. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so, in essence, the hold that the, the mega church phenomenon has on African American communities is, in many ways, part and parcel of uh, the regime of commodity capitalism and the degree to which African Americans um, are, unfortunately, you know, beset by you know this mentality that we have to tie the way you know our, our last dime in life. Um, we have to devote, you know, all of our social and cultural capital, you know, to this institution that is not really putting anything back in, into our communities to make them sustainable, you know, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but within a macro basis um, in terms of the degree to which our communities are so entrenchedly segregated and so 
beset by issues like over-incarceration, by uh, the epidemic dropout that we see in high schools, in middle schools, in African-American communities. You know, all of those issues have not been substantively redressed by the dominance of the African-American, uh, the black church in inner city African-American communities. And this is a deficit that we absolutely need to be critically conscious of. Well, I, I wanna bring the audience in on this wonderful conversation. This is a great conversation. So if you could please um, go to the mics that we have in the aisles and uh, formulate your questions. And as you're getting that together, I want to kind of bring this full circle with the panel up here and ask the big question, uh, um, are science and faith compatible? Can they be compatible? I think that science and faith as concepts are completely incompatible with one another. Religion is essentially the, a, a system of belief that is founded on either not looking at the evidence or ignoring the evidence and is, is based on you must have faith regardless of what you see, whereas science is the exact opposite. Science is a, a system that must require testing, it must require the ability to prove something wrong, and it's systematically, it's systematically designed to disprove things and ignore and cast aside faith. So I think they're diametric, diametrically opposed. That said, there are situations where in an individual they may be able to coexist at that individual level, but only in terms of when the person takes their religion and pushes it aside when it comes to the science. So you can have a person of faith who's a great scientist, but those people always ignore their religion when they're doing their science work or they will fail in that regard. I, I think that's absolutely right. I would, I would add really almost nothing to what Todd has said except that there are some people who call themselves religious who are not religious in the sense in which most people here would understand right. it. They are religious in the Einsteinian sense or the Stephen Hawking sense uh, where they have a kind of you might call it spirituality, a kind of reverence for the deep problems of the universe or something like that. As Einstein himself said over and over again, it's nothing to do with a personal God. When you're talking about a personal God, which is based upon faith and tradition and authority and revelation, um, then everything said, that Todd said is, is absolutely right. I think it is incompatible. Okay, thank you for this. Now, we open the floor to the audience and we alternate the microscope. So, ladies first, please. Um, hi, uh, I would just like to say, Mr. Dawkins, I'm a huge admirer. You make me proud to be an atheist and because of you, I see everything in evolutionary terms. And I thank you so much for that. Um, I would like to bring up that a lot of, of the black community fails to recognize that to put it in a bad way, that the white man forced their religion on the black community and they were not Christians before. And be, they, when they were bought here, they were pushed in, in, into this religion that really was uh, made by their aggressors. Uh, and I was wondering, what do you think about that? Yeah. Um it's a, it's a complex dynamic because there are a lot of nuances there in terms of you know, African-American um, acceptance, if you will, of Christian dogma. I mean, certainly Christianity was not just attractive to African-Americans because of this potential for an eternal reward, but it was also a springboard, an intellectual and an epistemological springboard for African-Americans to critique the regime of the dominant culture, the regime of white supremacy, of the regime of you know, barbarism, whereby African bodies were literally being commodified and objectified and exploited for you know, production and reproduction. So it was a means of allowing African Americans to achieve voice and to achieve resistance, again, within brutally terroristic Holocaust conditions. So that's one nuance. But again, you know, if we look at that tradition, and particularly within you know, the abolitionist perspective, there were thinkers, you know, as Anthony pointed out, like Frederick Douglass, you know, who actively 
deconstructed religiosity and actively critiqued white Christian hypocrisy and also critiqued African-American investment in the iteration of you know, white Christianity you know, vis-a-vis trying to reach this eternal reward and, and achieve you know, some kind of moral uh, bearing, if you will, through the promise of redemptive suffering. And so you have that tension there um, within African-American social and political and theological discourse, if you will, you know, whereby there is this active attempt to deconstruct, you know, to look at the degree to which Judeo-Christian tenets you know, um, were compatible with an enlightenment notion of Africanness as being the savage other, you know, as, as occupying the space, you know, outside of the civilized self or the universal subject, you know, of European civilization and European culture. I think it's interesting that the slave masters essentially created an environment that was so horrific that there was this creation of a need for salvation that they in turn filled with their religion. And that lives on to this day. There's a, we find ourselves in a situation where the bodies were freed, but the religion of the slave master lives on and continues to enslave the minds. And I think it's about time that the minds are free. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, Next. that's true of Islam as well. Islam was spread through, through, through slavery. And once again, the religion of the slave masters lives on. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Yeah, uh, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. Um, it's been a really illuminating conversation. I, uh, I, I wanted to ask anyone who's willing to answer. There's, uh, there's typically the uh, theology and uh, sort of I guess, evolution on uh, two opposing sides. And I wanted to know if, I mean, you touched on it earlier, uh, this Professor Dawkins about, uh, it's, you know, it's not a personal God and there is no controversy. I was wondering if theology allowed for an impersonal, self-regulating universe. And um, if so, if there was some sort of involvement in our evolution over time between that um, impersonal sort of body and, you know, because I, I and, and and I hope I ask this well because I I I, I hear in, in, the, in the little I know of evolution, I've heard of um, uh, the gaps, certain gaps in uh, fossil evidence found, uh, certain gaps in in our evolution that can't be attributed to any um, fossil evidence, and some have attributed that to uh, those evolutionary gaps in some sort of um, you know entity responsible for sort of uh, I don't know, some involvement in an entity greater than ourselves. I have trouble hearing. I think, um, I think he's referring to guided evolution, um, the God of the gaps sort of. Yeah, the ga yeah. gaps in the fossil record. Is that, is that what he was Yeah, and, 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 there's, and, and is, can that be attributed to, in your opinion, some sort of uh, impersonal uh, universe? Yes. Um, well, we're lucky to have any fossils at all. Um, because th there was no rule that said that fossils had to come. We said, it's a great boon to us that we do have fossils. You shouldn't think of fossils as being a, a sort of cinematic record of everything that happened in the history of life. Rather, you should think of it as being a series of lucky still snapshots. Uh, and the snapshots obviously have gaps between them. It would be remarkable if they didn't. Um, but just because there are gaps between the snapshots, it doesn't mean that if there was a cinematic record, you wouldn't see the evolutionary progression in between. What you can say is that not a single fossil has ever been found, which is in the wrong place, the wrong time, uh, for evolution to be true. And that could so easily have been true it could so easily have been, evolution is very vulnerable to disproof, because it, as J.B.S. Haldane famously said, it would only take one rabbit in the Precambrian <laughs> to utterly disprove evolution. Nothing like that, no, nothing remotely like a rabbit in the Precambrian has ever been found. The fact that there are some places where nothing has been found doesn't really signify one way or the other. It would be nice if it were there, but it doesn't matter. Um, even without a single fossil, there were no fossils anywhere in the world, the evidence for evolution would be totally secure 
because it comes from other sources comparing modern animals and plants, comparing their anatomy, their biochemistry, looking at the geographical distribution. Everything is exactly the way it should be if evolution were, were true. I, I guess to sort of summarize, I, I, uh, evolution does not disprove an entity, it does not disprove a theology, but it certainly makes a God unnecessary. There's no reason for a God. We, we can see how things naturally occurred. No God necessary. Okay, next question, please. Thank you. Uh, well, after you just said that, I had another question. But <laughs> uh, I, I often ask people, uh, you know, what they believe and why. And I, I ask some young men that you know don't go to church. Uh, and I ask them, do you believe in God? And I do that just to see if that person does believe, and almost always they say, young African-American men, yes, I do. So it doesn't matter if they're in prison or if they've never gone to church uh, since they were five or whatever. They all seem to say, yes, I believe in God. They don't know why. All right, and I'm beginning to think that we are afraid to actually say that I think something different. It's that, that idea of acceptance that you mentioned earlier. Is it in the, and my question is, in the African American uh, uh, church or in our society, are we just afraid to embrace the science? Is it, do we feel we won't be accepted by anyone else if we say, hmm, maybe evolution's right and not necessarily my preacher? Um, I, I, I know in certain cases that it's not that. Um, blacks are afraid of accepting it. It's just that the science is never presented to them in the first place. They're shielded well, from it. Well, I, 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 I almost disagree with that because, well, but, but, but maybe it's a, just a different case. I look at myself. Uh, I come from both a Hebrew tradition and a Catholic tradition, but from both parents. And I learned both of them, and, but by the age of six, I said, this can't possibly be right. <laughs> and I went and looked for the science myself. And, well, maybe because it was available to me in books, but I went and I read. And it's available. It's there. It, it, is, it is available. And I'll, I'll tell you from a, uh, a, a just from my own per personal experience, I, I grew up in Prince George's County, Largo. Okay? I grew up in Prince George's <laughs> County, and I, was, I, I, I went to great schools out there. I had a wonderfully, wonderful supporting uh, cast of a family, and I, I was well-educated. I didn't hear my first word of evolution until my freshman year of college. Wow. I mean, it might have had something to do with that. I, I was educated half the time in Catholic schools, but, <laughs> but half the, time, the other half the time I was in public schools. And I, I mean, the, the information, it wasn't in front of me. It wasn't out there. I didn't hear my first word until Bio 106. So, so no, no Mendel, no, right. no, no biology, no, you know, when you're, when biology, you're yes. with, evolution, when you no. see biology, when you learn biology, okay. when Can you... I just cut in here? Yeah. <laughs> let's, well, done. Let, let's, yeah. well, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah. 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 Can, I, can I ask yeah. a question? So, yeah, sure. I take the privilege here. Um, you know, a few years ago, Newsweek had a, a study, and they surveyed <clears throat> all countries in the world according to their secular belief, secular development, or animistic belief, and their technological and uh, development in the society. And they found out, for instance, that countries like Burkina Faso, Haiti, they had a lot of influence of animistic traditions and very low technological development, so basically no secular society. And then off of the top range were countries like Sweden, Norway, Finland, Japan, very high technical development, very <laughs> secular societies. And you had the European countries where they should be. And guess the only outlayer was what? United States. United States. United States, high technical development and in terms of uh, influence of religion and non-secular society, they were worse than Turkey. 
Even Israel is more secular than the United States. So my question is, how do you explain that? And how do you explain the hyper religiosity of the U.S. versus yes, well, other because they are they are more nations. less secular than Turkey. I mean, Turkey is more uh, enlightened than the United States. Yeah, well, I think, okay, if we look at contemporary politics, I mean, certainly we're all familiar um, with the aegis of the religious right in this country and the degree to which the religious right, you know, has really hijacked the whole discourse around public morality and values and the degree to which the religious right has really been an arm of the GOP, of the Republican Party, and has uh, been able, you know, to establish public policy that is more or less theocratic in basis, you know, in terms of uh, really eroding, you know, the wall between the separation of church and state, in terms of, you know, implementing uh, really egregious policies like faith-based initiatives and all the other um, government subsidies that are conferred upon religious organizations. So um, I think that we have to look at politics and then the Judeo-Christian origins and emphasis of the United States, you know, with regard to Puritanism and Protestantism and the degree to which those have really been, um, you know, eminent, unfortunately, forces in, you know, defining mores and cultural ideology in the United States. Well, I acknowledge that, but it's still not, still puzzled. But in any case, uh, let's go to this side now. Hi. Um, hearing your anti-slavery rhetoric earlier is ironic viewing the non, largely non-Howard audience here. I was wondering how welcoming is the um, atheist community to black thought and um, as well as um, is, is, is being able to be atheist just a symptom of white privilege to be allowed to reject a higher power for idealizing themselves through atheism. Thank you. I would begin by saying you're giving something away, that there is evidence within the context of African American culture that suggests humanistic and atheistic perspectives and opinions going back to the blues. In the same way that we cannot accurately date the spirituals, we cannot accurately date the blues. Don't think in terms of race records of the 1920s. The blues predate that. And within the blues, you have a critique of the theological assumptions very much alive within churches and within African American theology in more general terms. There is evidence from that period of the blues to the present of atheism within African American communities. It's not a foreign body invading African American communities. It's a perspective held dear within African American communities that we've just not recognized, in part because churches have had such good PR. But let me say one other thing with respect to this. After the Civil Rights Movement, there's a decline in black church enrollments. 70s, 80s, beginning of the 90s, black churches are suffering. People are disillusioned. They're leaving these churches. When they begin to come back into these churches, they come not necessarily for theological or religious reasons. The black middle class moves back into these churches for cultural reasons, right, to connect to African American community. And they falsely think this is the most appropriate way to do it. So they're not necessarily buying the theology. They're not necessarily buying the religiosity, but for them it is a source of cultural connection and business opportunity. And so if you have to, if you have to sit and listen to the sermon and just kind of, mm, <laughs> but it means a certain type of cultural connection for yourself, for your kids, and business opportunities, then you do it. All that to say that there's been a pragmatic reason for many African Americans remaining involved in black churches. It's not theological, it's not religious, it's pragmatic, right? But atheism, again, has always been present within African American communities. It's just been underappreciated. The other thing that I would say, um, again, looking at uh, this dynamic in terms of socioeconomic and class context is, if we look at inner city African American communities, what are the most visible institutions? They're churches, you know, be they storefront churches, you know, for example, um, in my community, which is South LA, there are about 18 storefront churches within a one mile radius. And, you know, they span 
the, the galaxy, you know, in terms of denominations. But those storefront churches are really providing social welfare yes. services. They're providing connective tissue for African American folk who may not be able to access social welfare services in other venues by dint of de facto segregation. And I think this is what, this is what distinguishes African American communities and Latino communities from, say, white working class communities where you may have uh, viable and sustainable nonprofits, where you may have viable and sustainable recreational centers, um, you know, green space, um, you know, other forms of you know, providing people with not just uh, cultural and you know, interpersonal connections, but also sort of the bedrock socioeconomic necessities that are required uh, within a quote unquote civilized community. Um, and the fact that this is a liberal democracy, you know, which is predicated upon commodity capitalism that absolutely disadvantages people of color within quote unquote inner city communities is something that really entrenches this pervasiveness and this acceptance of religiosity as being the only exercise of our subjectivity and expressivity as peoples of color. I'd like to okay. add one thing on that particular question. Can I can't you, can speak you be short? for... Yes, quickly. I can't speak for the system and I can't speak for the institutions, but as a white man in the free thought community who's very active, I'd like to personally invite every African American in this room and outside this room to get involved yeah, yeah. and get active in this community. You are welcome. Okay. We have maybe time for one more question. If you're very quick, we can put in two questions. Cool. Good evening. My name is Daniel Coates. I'm a student here at Howard University, and I want to personally thank all of the panelists on the stage today. I think this dialogue today was very stimulative uh, and very relevant. And in the future, I want to help advance this dialogue in the community and in the Christian church. Uh, <laughs> this question is directed towards uh, Dr. Dawkins. I'm a Christian, and my best friend here is Dominic, and he's an atheist, right? And that is like a brother to me, and I love him to death. Uh, what is your interest? in other, uh, well, Christians and other different religions and living in atheists, living in harmony with them. Do you have an interest in that with those who are not trying to impose their beliefs on you? And lastly, are you ready to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? That's a good part of My interest. I had to ask. <laughs> My, There's still time. My, 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 interest is that I, I, my interest is that I care passionately about the truth. And um, I'm actually rather less interested in the role of religion in society and all that kind of stuff. I just care what's true. I mean, is there, as a matter of fact, a supreme being who created the universe or not? And I think it's a fascinating question. I think it's a scientific question. I think it's a question that we have uh, pretty much a very, very strong indication of the, of the answer, which is no. Uh, and I, I don't care who you are, what community you come from, or what church you go to, or anything else. I think I want to talk to you, have a dialogue with you about the evidence, one way or the, or the other. We'll have a friendly conversation about it, and, um, and I'll win the argument. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and let me, let me, before you go, let me, let me catch you. Um, we're going to have this conversation afterwards. I mean, I'm going to stick around with uh, the second students at Howard University who... Dominic is a proud member, a very new member. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, there they are over there. And um, we're going to have this conversation afterwards. I'm a PhD student, so I'm used to being on this campus till 3 in the morning. So we, we're going to stick around. Please, everybody with questions, we're going we're gonna to keep talking, and we're going to have more events. We're going to keep, this is just the start of the conversation, everyone. So uh, with that, I, I really want to. Um, well, on, on, let me stay on that note. Maybe some this is going to okay. 8.30. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we, we have to get to the book signing because we, we've got to be out of this wow. building eventually. But like I said, we can continue this conversation a little bit later. I'm very sorry about that. I really need to do some bookkeeping things and thank uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cornwell from the Howard University, I mean, from the Founda Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, Dr. Werner Graf from the Howard University Department of Physiology and Biophysics.
I want to thank Debbie Goddard for the Center of Inquiry on campus and African American Humanism. And Melody Hensley from the Center for Inquiry, DC. Hey, Melody. Uh, I also want to thank Ayanna Watson for the Black Atheist of America. Where are you at, Ayanna? And the James Randi Educational Foundation and Secular Student Alliance. Thank you so much. You, without, you guys, without you guys, it would have never happened. And please thank our wonderful panelists. Please.